Matthew is pulling us in two directions at the same time here. First, it's a warning, just like it has been since. The baptism of John, is it from man or is it from heaven? It's a warning to anyone who has a leadership position in the church. Oh, and that reminds me, we had complaints about this the last time I mentioned it. Pastor, elders, council, even Sunday school teachers are warned that even though they are absolutely necessary and much appreciated for the smooth operation of this corner of the kingdom of heaven, they should take care not to reach for control of God's church like the Pharisees did and like modern-day Pharisees do. That's how you can tell what a Pharisee is. Not only is a Pharisee self-righteous, but a Pharisee uses self-righteousness to take control of a congregation. Understanding, of course, that service, decision-making, and control are all different things. Well, wouldn't you know, someone was offended by that. So I want to nip it in the bud right here. There is yet another group I forgot to include in my list of sinners to be warned. The trustees want to be known as sinners too. I will heretofore remember to include the trustees and all their nefarious deeds by recalling the famous Christian hymn, and I quote, Chief of sinners though I be, the trustees are still worse than me. <laughs> Who demonstrate the truth of the scripture which, which says, Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. I'm being silly, of course. It's a warning. A warning. And I don't think it applies as a chastisement to us. Because there's no evidence here, none whatsoever, of malice. Jesus, it says, was aware of their malice. The church was theirs, and they did not want to relinquish it to Jesus, the Lord of the church, whose father planted the vineyard and invited in us laborers. So this is St. Matthew pulling us in another direction. It's more than a warning. It's comfort. This is a picture of Jesus wrestling you from the iron grasp of those who would control you. No matter how controlling your pastor is, may it never be. No matter how controlling your leaders might become, your Jesus has set you free. They had malice in their hearts, and they had every intention of trying to entangle Jesus in his words. And they wanted to entangle Jesus in his words so that they could justify killing him. The stakes are high, you see, but he knows their malice. So he calls them out in front of everyone, right there at church, the biggest church in the world, the biggest stage the temple of Jerusalem. Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? These are your oppressors. These are the people who want to put you in bondage to them. They want to bind you with works of righteousness. If you do what we, the religious leaders, tell you, you will be made right with the Lord. You know the talk, and it sounds so good. I mean, who doesn't want to be obedient to God? But they're hypocrites. They don't care whether you are obedient to God. They want you to be obedient to them. They're going to get Jesus. Make no mistake. But the whole world will know that Jesus is innocent. More than that, the whole world will know that they are hypocrites. They're bringing thugs with them already. Herodians. King Herod's henchmen. We'll meet Herod on the way to the cross, the one who thought Jesus was good for entertaining guests with his parlor magic. Look, water into really good wine. Oh, thank you, folks. And for my next trick, I'll heal this lame man, Abracadabra. 
Herod the king, authority figure, oversees God's people in civil affairs. The Pharisees, authority figures, oversee God's people in spiritual affairs. The both of them think they've got the Son of God cornered. Boy, are they in for a surprise. God says, I form light and create darkness. The Pharisees are stumbling around in the dark. I make well-being and create calamity. King Herod is falling headlong into destruction. I am the Lord who does all these things. It's about to get very dark for Jesus, who is called the light of the world. Things are about to become calamitous for him, who brings peace to the stormy waters. They will come for him in the darkness with clubs to subdue him, and they will lie about him in the darkness. Then they will nail him to the tree where he will hang in the darkness, crying out to God who created the darkness for him. Shouldn't he be fighting back? When your church is under the power of the Pharisees, and you can find examples of this near to you and far away from you, it can be pretty dark. If this is God's church, you think to yourself, what hope do we have? Where is the God who promises to be kind to me? Where is the God who binds up all my wounds, heals all my sickness? Where is the Father who dries my tears, the shepherd who carries me when I am weary? Where is the Comforter, the Holy Spirit? Why did God create darkness and calamity for His church? This Jesus who struggles for breath in the darkness under the power of the dark forces is paying for your sins. He's paying for the sins of Herod and for the sins of the Pharisees too, even as they themselves murder him. He pays for your sins in the darkness, sweeping away evil. Do you have any doubts how you inherit eternal life? Does anyone in here still think that your good deeds pay for your sins? No, you know that the Pharisees are wrong. They're hypocrites. Everything they stand for is deception and conspiracy, exposing self-righteousness as complete futility. When he came back from the dead, it became clear that Jesus gives you life not them. Jesus is at work in the darkness. He's not helpless at all. When God creates darkness and calamity for his church, be comforted. He is at work for you. People will know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides him. Jesus is the Lord and there is no other.